So the last speaker of tonight is uh, Ramesh Sampa. Sampa. He is a machine learning engineer with a background in software engineering. And he has worked and has a special affinity for NumPy, Pandas, and Scikit. Most importantly today, he's going to be speaking about PyTorch. Let's give a warm round of applause for Ramesh. Oh, actually, let's keep that round of applause for when the screen works. Oh. All right, yes, fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. If you need to stand up and stretch, totally feel free to do it. If you need to leave, uh, you know, you have something else to do, um, I would try not to remember you, but uh, feel free. OK, yeah, so today uh, my, uh, I'm going to talk about PyTorch. It's one of the newer uh, deep learning frameworks. And as the name indicates, it's got a strong Python binding. And um, yeah, so let's get into it. Uh, just a little bit about what uh, I hope to do today is to help you get started. It's the last bullet point. Forget everything else. All right, so a little bit of understanding of machine learning and some familiarity with logistic aggression will help uh, with today's talk. All right, so whenever you talk about machine learning, deep learning, AI, a um, lot of people try to see where is all these things in this ecosystem or these larger boxes. Uh, I think of deep learning as just AKA neural networks, and it's just one of the tools in your toolbox of machine learning, and uh, I don't think about AI because there's a lot of it I don't know. So anything you don't know, you call AI. And then once you, <laughs> once you, once you make sense of it, then you call it, oh, that's just machine learning. <laughs> All right, so what is machine learning? So machine learning is uh, the trying to approximate that unknown function in the middle, which to try to give in a set of inputs, or also called examples, and, and some labels. We're talking about supervised machine learning here. Um, so we're trying to approximate this unknown function. That's the goal of machine learning. So then, what is deep learning? So deep learning is just applying many, many layers of this simple machine learning network we saw. So it is just function upon function upon function of trying to approximate this bigger Again, the same unknown approximate function. So, okay. So um, this is a slide, as you see there, taken from CS231, Stanford. Um, they had this last year. And, and you can see there's lots and lots of deep learning frameworks. We're going to primarily talk about PyTorch today with some references to TensorFlow, because every time we talk about PyTorch, people say, oh, what about TensorFlow and Keras? So we will talk some references to it, but there is a number of these frameworks out there. And what's nice is everything has a Python binding as a first class binding. So, so what does the deep learning framework do? So deep learning framework I think of as, as these set of functions, it's kind of tensors and variables to get your inputs. And, and, and the main thing it does is build a computation graph. And the computation graph has to do two things. Uh, it needs to have automatic differentiation because you can't write your own differentiation. Well, you can, but then nobody would use it. And it needs to run on GPU, because otherwise, when you build these deeper networks, it will take a very long time on your CPU. And it needs to have a really nice API. I think um, you know, we are tired of using very bad APIs. Uh, and then it needs to have really good data loading, because 80% of the time is just spent loading our data. And then it needs to have a way to deploy our models. So we'll touch on a number of them. Uh, specifically with PyTorch, and then also give some comparison with TensorFlow and Keras. Okay, let's talk about tensors and variables. Uh, tensors are nothing more than an arrays, or you can think of lists uh, in Python. So that's how you would declare uh, the tensors in PyTorch. So PyTorch uh, is basically a library import torch, is, is your PyTorch. And, uh, it's, it's, its API is very similar to NumPy API, just like every other uh, API is also similar to NumPy API. So uh, one thing also you will see is as you run that um, function, 
or the call, function call there, it will evaluate immediately and show in your notebook. Okay? And uh, they have their own data types, but it's very compatible with NumPy data types. Okay, so tensor is an in-dimensional array. That's the general definition. And uh, one thing, uh, and then when you talk about variables, variables are just a thin wrapper on top of uh, tensors. And what's uh, really nice about what differentiates, I think, PyTorch from other uh, frameworks is PyTorch variables hold gradients along with data. And that's going to be very useful uh, later on when we try to uh, debug our network. Okay, so holding data and gradients together is, is really makes um, our job easier of using these APIs. Okay, so this is how your PyTorch code looks. So it's got deep integration to NumPy. So you see the first line, you know, you can convert a tensor into NumPy, you can convert NumPy into tensor, you know, and you can index with negative indexing, you can do everything that you can do with NumPy with, with PyTorch. And this is how your TensorFlow code will look. We try to do the same thing. Um, of course, TensorFlow has in, you know, interactive session, other things that we try to bridge the gap. But uh, in general, most TensorFlow code, code look like this. And you cannot see anything there that is useful other than it's building this computation graph. So it's a big difference. There's difference between imperative and declarative. So in PyTorch, as you run it, it's imperative. It's, it's evaluating right there. In TensorFlow, it's declaring, it's being part of this logic. All right, so let's do a logistic regression in uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow. All right, so let's take a simple example uh, of a linearly separable model. So you have two classes there, and then you have two variables, x1, x2. It's very easy, it's linearly separable. You can draw a line there that separates these two classes. You don't need deep learning to do this, but you will do. So the way uh, we're going to build this is we have two inputs, x1, x2. We're going to have that, uh, you know, logistic regression with a sigmoid activation function, and that's all the entire uh, model is going to be. And in machine learning terms, so you have input features, observed labels, and then you are going to build this machine learning model. Uh, we're going to get predictions from machine learning model, and then we're going to compare with the observed labels over there, compare these two, and then update our weights of the ML model. How would you do this in TensorFlow? Okay, this is one way to do it. There are many ways to do it. So you'll first uh, declare a graph, uh, a tf.graph, and then you will declare inputs, x and y, and then you would declare your model, which is weights, biases, and logits. Uh, but of course, this is using the core TensorFlow. You can also use the layers API to replace all of that with one line in TensorFlow. And then you go ahead and define your optimizer and the loss functions. And then you would independently run the graph. And when you run the graph, you would reference, uh, you, you back up. When you run the graph, you are creating a session. And then in the session, you reference the graph. And, and then you have a training loop where you, for n number of epochs, you keep running this until the weights gets updated to the you know, to, to a reasonable place. And then you can run predictions on that model. So previous slide was defining the graph. This slide is running the computation graph. And then so session holds all the weights, all the state, and then you have to save the weights within the session for you to reload uh, the graph with the state. How do you do this in Keras? <coughs> Keras is a higher level API on top of TensorFlow. So you would define the model, but it's much more terse uh, than what we even saw in TensorFlow there. And then you would run the model. and and this API is very similar to what you usually see in scikit-learn API, where you just call model.fit and it'll do its magic. And let's look at PyTorch. Okay, how would you do this? Uh, you see the top line over there. You are defining the model. Um, you are defining the optimizer that you want to use, and also the loss function. Those are the first three blocks there. You see similarity between how Keras was defined and how this PyTorch model is defined. And then you would run a forward propagation or run the model. And then you run a backward propagation. And it looks like it's like too much boilerplate code here. But we can make it into functions. And second is actually having access to this level of data. It's going to be super useful when you look at other, you know, when you need to debug your neural network. 
So we'll get to that. All right, so of course, all these models do an excellent job of separating, drawing this line that separates those two things. But again, you don't need your know, networks for, for this. Um, so one thing I want to highlight is, is the Layers API in PyTorch uh, that we just saw. You see, there is a module called torch.nn, which has all the neural network libraries. So you, we are using the linear model, uh, which is also called dense in, uh, I think, Keras. And then you have a linear model, um, you have a sigmoid activation, and then another linear outputs, and you can print the model this way. But you can also define it as a Python class that inherits from nn.module. And this is what I think uh, differentiates PyTorch from the rest of the frameworks, is being able to define it as a class and define your own forward propagation, which means you can write your own you know, Python code to debug and evaluate and reroute. You can do all sorts of things in this forward propagation. Again, you don't have to write the backward propagation, which you can. You can define a backward propagation, but that is automatically differentiated it keeps the computation graph and differentiates automatically. Okay? Question? Yes. What is the f dot sigmoid? Oh, yeah, is a functional API. So sigmoid has no parameters. So you only want to store the state of things that have parameters. So that's why the in, in the init, I only store the, the layers that have parameters. But as a sigmoid layer, which does not have parameters, you don't need to store it as an instance variable. You can just, it's a functional API. Pure yeah. Function. yeah, thanks. Yeah, so it has all the activations of, of this functional API as well. Good question, yeah. All right, so let's take a non-linear data set. It's not directly separable. Specifically, let's take a look at this data set, the spiral, got three classes. You know, you need to go to a more complex network. Um, simple models will not be able to separate these layers, okay? And particularly, we're going to go to a one hidden layer neural network. So we're going to have two inputs again, and then we have n number of hidden layers, uh, single hidden layer, but the n number of nodes in the hidden layer, and we have the outputs. This is the network we're going to build. And to build it <coughs> in PyTorch, you do exactly this. You define a class, uh, net. You don't have to, but you, this is the API we're going to look at here for on. So you, know, you can declare a class called net, and that inherits from Torch in a module. And then you define your weights on the init, and then you define your forward propagation stuff. Let me jump to my Jupyter notebook here. Okay. Second. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so this is the same data set that we just looked at. Uh, and then um, we have this linear model. And I, I wrote a function train, um, which is basically the same function I'm going to keep repeatedly running for different network architecture. And you, you will see this type of workflow in almost everybody's uh, PyTorch code so that they don't want to keep writing the training loop all the time, okay? All right, so then you could actually do this. So you could say, you run the training loop, you instantiate the model, and then you run the training loop, almost very similar to how Keras API did it. You create the model, you run a fit on the model, and then um, you see that the model actually is not doing that great, and then the training loss is also very high, right? It's like zeros down here, it's, it's quite bad, and then uh, there's a small plotting function that I found online that's just very useful to look at this. And you see that it's actually drawing three lines over there, which is not what we intend to do. So it's not no way to separate these things by three lines. And then I found out that actually I have a bug in my code. I forgot to add the nonlinear activation to my hidden layer. So if you add linear model upon linear model, it's still a single long linear model. So I added the sigmoid function. So this is, again, uh, things you can easily find out uh, when you do plots and other things to look at your model results. And then I rerun the model with, uh, with the sigmoid activation, and it still didn't perform as well, okay? And then I said, oh, it's probably because I have only two hidden nodes. I could just increase the hidden nodes, or I could, or I could increase the hidden layers. So I said, okay, let me increase the hidden nodes. I went up to 32. And uh, just a you know, number from thin air, there is no thing to it other than just power of two makes looks nice, but there's no other reason for doing it. And then you'd see, oh, it starts to now make a little bit of sense. It's trying to create, separate these three things. It's still not doing it as well. And, and this is really what happens in most problems uh, when you work on it. 
Like it, it, it's, you get to this point, it, it works okay, but it actually doesn't work as well. And you're like, what do I do next, right? And then you think of this as this black box of deep learning that you can't unpack unless you're working with PyTorch. Then you could actually say, in our training function, I actually extracted the gradients of each layer. And then, because gradients and weights are stored together, I extracted the gradients and then I plotted these gradients. And then you could see that the red line is the gradient at the last level, and the blue line is the gradient at the first hidden node. And you see that one, two things. One, the gradient actually doesn't get to the front, uh, to the, um, it's really small, that gets to the first layer. And then it also dies at you know 30 epochs or 30 runs or 40 runs. Like I, if I keep running for 3,000 runs, it'll make no difference because there's no loss getting propagated these gradients, okay? And this is what is called the vanishing gradient problem. So the gradient is vanishes as it moves forward. And, and then you can say, now that you know what the problem is, you can make some corrective action, which of adding more layers or increasing more nodes uh, without reason sometimes, that you actually can debug and find out. And now you say, okay, I have a choice of activation functions for the hidden layer. You tried sigmoid, it seemed to have a gradient problem. Uh, we can try TANH, we can try RELU, or you can look at this particular nice blog post that somebody wrote, but you can actually drop, look at all of these and see how the gradients, you know, you can see the gradient of sigmoid is 0.25, that is the highest gradient is 0.25, and then that's at when, when the activation is 0.5, and then uh, whereas for other models, TANH or RELU, you would, particularly ReLU, you have gradient of zero when value is below zero, but gradient is one, which means, which means that it will fully propagate the entire loss to the previous layer. Okay? So that's why a lot of people choose ReLU and a variation of ReLU for all hidden layers until the final layer. Okay? So let's change our network to use ReLU. Okay? And same, same architecture, same 32 hidden nodes, uh, same 50 epochs, and you run it is 98% accuracy, which is what we want to see. And then you see what's more and more nice is actually how it nicely separates these three, um, you know, classes in this data set. Okay, and of course now we should also plot the gradients just to see how it is. You see this um, red line, which is the uh, first layer, and then the green line, which is the last layer. The the green that that is you can see a lot of places where the gradient nicely propagates to the earlier layers. And, and then, um, so the, the, you, know, you can see that the, you don't have, you know, that big of a vanishing gradient problem. It can happen in ReLU as well, because uh, you are setting half the neurons to zero when, uh, when the activation is uh, zero, but, uh, but it's got less of a problem, so. And this is one of the powerful reasons uh, I actually like PyTorch, is that you may not be a you know, consider yourself as a researcher, but this is kind of problem we actually end up all the time is the model doesn't train as well, and then how do you go from there to debug uh, to why it is not working? I think that's uh, something I found PyTorch to be easier to access. I'm sure the same things can be done in TensorFlow and Keras. Uh, you know, probably there are tons of examples that do it, but it may not be as simpler as how we you have to go to TensorBoard or some other places to do it. Okay. I'm going to go back to my slides. All right. Um, what am I doing on time? Okay, 35. Okay. 10 minutes. I'm going to skip the computation graph uh, section. I will put it all in there. Okay. Okay. There you go. I'm going to go to data loaders because this is my favorite topic as to why uh, I think uh, PyTorch is really awesome. Is uh, most of the time, we're dealing with our own data sets and not dealing with uh, some tutorial data sets or some, you know, fabricated data set. Like, how do we view our data set as inputs to these models? Okay? That's the real challenge. And how does PyTorch do it? It defines three things. In fact, two things. There's a data set object and there's a data loader object, okay? And data loader is just a wrapper around data set. You could think of, it makes it into a generator. So then it feeds back. So once you wrap your data set in a data loader, you can do this. You can just use it as if it's a generator object, and then for, you can do a you know, X, Y in the generator, it'll give you uh, each batch at a time, okay? 
and then how complex is this data set object that I want to define for my data set. These three things. So you define your custom data set class that um, you know, inherits from TD data set. And you define three things. One is init. So in initialization, you can take any sort of things. The x, y I defined there. It can be your data frame. It can be, I, I, almost all the time, I use CSV files uh, that has a reference to images that I store somewhere else in S3 or somewhere. So it can do any sort of things. Um, completely Python code there. Uh, and then it needs only two methods, length and get item. So length will tell you how long is your data set so that it can know how many batches it needs to run. And then get item is for a single index, give me the single value, okay? And uh, beyond the, so what it does is it, it, it does multi-processing um, and then it will load a bunch of these custom data set objects and then generate these values. We'll, we'll see an example. So here's an example, okay? So I have the spiral data set, the same data set we looked at. How did I convert it into, uh, into this uh, custom data set object? Uh, you see this bunch of code up there is just input validation. It's got nothing to do with actual machine learning. I'm just making sure that the input is either a NumPy array or actually a torch tensor. That's all it is doing, okay? Uh, there's only useful lines of code is these three lines of code, self.x, self.y, and then uh, I return the length of my data in length object, and in my get item, I'm just indexing on my x and y and returning that x and y index, okay? And once I have this custom data set defined, I can, um, so here is how I define the custom data set. I can pass it to data set loader, which is by passing my data set, then I say how, how large of a batch size I want. Do I want to shuffle this data? And it's got a bunch of other parameters that you could do. And, and then you just say for batch, for basically X and Y in this data loader, you run your training loop, okay? And, and what, why is that very useful abstraction? The reason it's useful abstraction is you can now compose your transformations. So for example, uh, you can say, I want to randomly crop my, flip my images, crop my images, resize my images. You can do all sorts of things in this transform function Okay, that you will you could process in your data set loader and bind you all of this are just python classes which means you can look at the pytorch code and see how they have written as well and it's the same three uh, functions and and then you can keep adding or not adding uh, these transformation functions and then you can pass it to data loader and provide a batch size and number of workers um, this is how you will do it in keras okay keras gives you this gigantic image data generator with all sorts of bells and whistles options. The reason they do it is for you to add your own stuff is damn hard. So, um, <laughs> and even with all of this, you will find use cases where it is not going to help you. So, um, so I think it's, it's just a difference between the, uh, thinking about these abstractions as, you know, you pick and choose in your compose function versus, you know, writing this larger uh, in inputs. So deployment, so this is a favorite topic among TensorFlow lovers. They will say, well, it's all nice and good, but you know, how scalable is this, okay? So here is how I have deployed PyTorch. Uh, I'm not claiming it's scalable at all, okay? Uh, so I have my data set, I train my model, I save my model weights, and then I have a thin Tornado app uh, that I will um, deploy this as an API service. Okay, this is how I mostly use PyTorch, or before PyTorch, this is how I do, I do scikit-learn as well. Scikit-learn, exactly the same process. So, but uh, here is how you could do as well. So uh, PyTorch uh, folks have basically said, I'm not, they're not going to actively uh, work on making this deployable model. Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to provide an export, export the model weights into this uh, Onyx, which is called the Open Network Exchange. Uh, which is an open frame, open, I guess, structure. I don't know what I call it. Maybe it's called framework, um, supported by Facebook, it, in it, Amazon, and Microsoft. Um, and then you can then import that into any of the other deep learning frameworks. So you can import into Cafe2, um, or you can import into TensorFlow, or MXNet, or CNTK, any of these frameworks. Okay. And uh, here are some examples. So that's the GitHub to look for Onyx. 
And just this week, uh, one person deployed a PyTorch uh, model into a mobile app, and, and exactly following the same process. And these are the three lines of code you need to export a PyTorch model into Onyx uh, framework. So it's, uh, it's really straightforward. Um, while I say that, I also want to say that Onyx is a fairly new uh, format, which means that it is getting the support from other uh, libraries, but it is still uh, fairly new. So use it with caution. So if you need to deploy, I think a Flask or Tornado may be easier, but Onyx is the way to go if you have, if you care about uh, deploying uh, as other models. All right, let's just a couple, couple of minutes. Yes. Oh, oh, five minutes, thank you. Yeah, I think we'll be good. Ecosystem, so PyTorch, uh, a GitHub as a bunch of repos. Uh, I want to talk specifically about uh, the main PyTorch repo, and then there is also, they have a, a specific uh, uh, extractors for or data transformers and, and pre-trained models for vision and then text. Uh, yeah, the same things you will see uh, in other frameworks as well. Uh, the way I think about it is PyTorch is there is a main module and there is got a bunch of sub modules. So YNN is uh, what we talked about, what we saw is a neural network module, but they have one for optimizers, they have one to multi-processing, and they also have uh, utils, which is uh, where the data set and data loader came from. But there's also Torch Text and Torch Vision, uh, which provides pre-trained models and also uh, additional transformations for your image processing and text. And uh, visualization, and this is another area where PyTorch folks have said they're not gonna work on it uh, as much. So, but you can use TensorBoard with PyTorch because TensorBoard um, is, uh, is just a file writer. You can write any, any anybody can write it for TensorBoard and then you can spin up a TensorBoard and visualize the loss function, visualize your embeddings, you can do everything that you can do in TensorFlow almost uh, in PyTorch. The reason I say almost is I don't know what else you can do. I only see a few things in TensorFlow. Uh, Facebook also has a wisdom um, uh, visualization tool. I have not used it, but some people say they could be used. And the extensions. Uh, so if, if uh, you know, if you want, uh, because this is a very, um, you know, core level, uh, API interface, uh, people have written their own extensions on top of it, so there is a scikit-learn Python, PyTorch bridge, which means you can use everything in scikit-learn, like, okay, like pipelines, everything, with your PyTorch, okay? Uh, feel free to check it out, uh, and then there is this, uh, there's a whole set of things for NLP, but there's a third one, Fastad AI, and they have a really good blog post as to why they switched from Keras to PyTorch in their uh, version two of their coursework. And then, yeah, it's, it's definitely got some celebrity status. Um, and um, yeah. So where do you start, right? So uh, certainly PyTorch.org is a great place to start. Uh, but if you want to say, I want to start with deep learning, I want to really understand this, uh, Coursera and Udacity have some reasonable uh, courses on it. And then uh, Fastat AI, uh, of course, uh, has, uh, you know, bunch of videos and tutorials uh, that also are, are using PyTorch, and they will tell you things that they were able to do in PyTorch that they could not do easily in Keras or TensorFlow uh, for other reasons to switch over. All right, so that's the talk, and uh, yeah, any questions? Questions, anyone? Yeah, um I saw like in the, uh, so the data loader, you can write your own Python code. Yes. Does that, it's like more versatile, but would it also um, make it slower? I, I remember some of like the gist of TensorFlow is that it never gets into memory. It's all Right, the, uh, so, the, so, so the way I think about it is, okay, uh, two things, okay. Um, I have not found it slower in my use cases. So every use case is slightly different, okay. Um, Second thing is, if it's slow while it is training, I actually don't mind, okay? Because it gives me flexibility to do other things that I cannot do. So people really talk about performance, they talk about evaluation or prediction performance, they're not talking really about training performance, okay? And, um, and then um, 
the most of the time is actually spent in its forward and backward prop that goes in your GPU. So uh, on this code, uh, some sort of variation of this also happens in the CPU for every framework unless you take the additional effort of using protobufs and TF records and other things that I don't pretend to understand. So yeah, so it is, uh, it is slower for sure, but it is, I have not found it slower at all because it does some, you know, multi-threading, multi-processing to make it faster. But yeah. What's the largest data set you had with uh, these kind of APIs? Like, yeah, so, APIs yeah, so what's the largest data set I have used it for? Okay. Yeah, so I know of is, is a hard question because uh, PyTorch also has the same pre-trained model on ImageNet with million data sets. Every example that you see in TensorFlow is also there in PyTorch, okay? So by that benchmark, everything that's there is also in PyTorch and the curves I've seen, they, they don't seem to have any separation of training time between these frameworks uh, because most of the time it's just spent on actually building the model in, C, in, in the GPU and uh, yeah, so I honestly cannot say I've done any specific benchmarks to say how slow or how fast it is. I think I think of it as developer happiness. Uh, like it is a fun environment to work in and use. Uh, but if you have a use case where um, you know you need to use you know some big data stuff, then maybe it's not the right thing to do. Um, yes. Test. Uh. Uh, were you demoing uh, TensorFlow 1.5 code there, eager execution stuff, or? Yeah, so no, uh, because eager is actually experimental. So, uh, and second thing is, um, uh, so, the, the, so the good thing is that because TensorFlow eager is there, the TensorFlow community or, or the developers have appreciate, you know, understand that this imperative style is very valuable from a developer productivity perspective. So it is certainly useful, um, and uh, yeah, so, I've not played with Eager, TF Eager. Uh, I mean, TensorFlow is really great. Like, I'm not trying to knock on it. I just want to say that PyTorch just gives you an easier learning curve and easier uh, place to get started. Uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned that uh, Onyx is a newish system uh, and that we should use it with care. Do you have any clues about like where it might be, you know, risky for us? Because I worry about like a subtle failure that you don't notice, but have, you know sneaks into your model. Um, so Onyx is only at the time of so basically you don't need Onyx. Okay, so what you can do is you can once you have the model trained. Okay, it is a computation graph with all the weights in all the layers. You can create a TensorFlow graph and copy weights from one graph to another graph. Like you can. That's basically what Onyx is doing for the most part. Okay, so. It is not uh, the, the performance, um, so it, it's not doing anything other, anything other than that. Um, I don't have experience using Onyx to really speak. Uh, is there any risk involved? I think if you have a really dynamic computation graph where you make decisions uh, in your forward function that's different based on the inputs, then I think that may, that may be harder to set up in an in, in Onyx framework. Um, but um, uh, the way I uh, deploy is this way. This is how I deploy. And, and because I don't have the same SLAs that somebody else might have uh, in, in expected performance, I, I, like this is for me to take my model from training to production really quickly. That's all. It is. Anyone else? All right. Ramesh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.